Joel and Ginger Millerman were looking forward to the birth of their second child. Then Ginger went for a sonogram and got some unexpected news. I called Joel and explained it to him. I was overwhelmed and crying, and I said, Honey, we're having twin boys. And he said, Yes. <laughs> he was really excited. And so that was the beginning of our adventure. Ginger went into labor early, and Brennan and Jared were born two months prematurely. Their lungs were underdeveloped, so they were placed on ventilators. But the ventilator that was keeping Jarrett alive was also damaging his lungs. If we were going to offer him any chance of a good survival, good quality of life with, uh, with good functioning lungs when he was older. Uh, we felt we needed to transfer him to the Children's Hospital in Denver where there were more sophisticated therapies that were available. And the nurse said, you can't touch him. It will just, his heart rate was out of control. He was overstimulated. She said, don't even touch him, just tell him goodbye. And I stood over his uh, bed just weeping and thinking I won't see him again. This is it. Joel flew with Jarrett to the Children's Hospital in Denver. It became very evident that his lungs weren't responding well at all to the to treatments. And he needed a constant pressure to keep his airways open. Eventually, he became critically ill um, to the point where you know, there was a question about whether he could survive even with the help of the ventilator. The higher levels of oxygen that he required to keep his saturation levels up were damaging his eyes. Before he was six months old, Jared had undergone major stomach reconstruction, had a feeding tube put in, and was given a tracheotomy. As Ginger watched her baby suffer, her relationship with God suffered. I was looking back at my life and I was thinking, God, I've given you everything. I have trusted you. I, I asked Jesus into my life when I was just a little girl. I wanted to be a missionary. I wanted to do something great for God, whatever he wanted me to be. And I say that because I was looking at my life thinking, God, I've given you all and this isn't fair. And I don't understand what you're doing. And I became very angry at God. And I had never experienced that before. Um, I had heard others talk about it, and I thought, well, that doesn't make sense. How could you ever be mad at God? But I started to realize what that was, and I stopped reading His Word. I stopped praying. Ginger didn't tell anyone about her struggle with God. And He really started to work on my heart, and He was so patient with me. And verses that I had learned since the time I was little started coming back to my heart and to my mind. And the one God really used for me was Romans 8, 28. And sometimes I think that's a verse that we memorize, and then we completely take it for granted. But it says, and we know, we know it, that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. And God really used that to dramatically change my heart. Okay, God, I know you're going to work this out for good. And I don't know how you're going to do it, but I trust you to do it. And my circumstances didn't change. Jared was still very critical. He wasn't doing well, but my heart changed. Doctors told Joel and Ginger that if Jared's condition didn't improve, they may have to decide whether or not to keep him on life support. We were just exhausted, overwhelmed. I just remember looking into Joel's eyes as we sat in that car and him and his eyes were full of tears. And my eyes welled up too and he said, honey, he's not gonna make it. And I started to cry and I said, I know. And we had never verbalized that. And it really hit us that night that sometimes God says no. And sometimes his plan isn't what we want. And we held each other and we cried and we came before the Lord for the first time really as a couple together and said, God, he is yours. And whatever your plan is for us, that's fine. The next morning when they got to the hospital, doctors told them that Jared had contracted a potentially fatal virus. They said, honestly, we don't even know how he's still alive. Jared's doctors decided to try one more medication. Three days later, they called the Millermans to another conference. All of his physicians were there, all of his specialists for his lungs, his heart, everything. They were all there and his nurses, and they all had tears in their eyes. And we knew it hadn't worked, and we knew this was it. And our head doctor spoke up and said, um, it's not working. He is such a fighter. We've done everything we can do, but it's not working. And when we meet, wean the medications out of his body at this point, um, he'll slip into a coma and pass away. Joel and Ginger were given just one option. And that is, we can just take him off the ventilator right now. He's sedated, he won't know what happened to him. We can just let him go right now. Ginger and I just looked at each other at that time 
And we asked some tough questions. We just said, is, is, is he brain dead? Is he, is he alive? I mean, is he gone? And they said, no, no, he's not brain dead. When Joel and I looked at each other, we both, it, it wasn't even a discussion. We shook our heads and we just said, we're gonna keep praying for a miracle. As doctors weaned Jared off his medication, his family continued to pray. I remember standing over his bed and, and laying our hands on his little tiny chest and just praying that God would do something amazing. And specifically, in my immature way, <laughs> I pray, God, this would be the perfect opportunity for you to show everybody what you can do. Jarrett survived the night. Doctors were shocked when blood tests came back with near normal results. It was the closest to normal it had been in his entire life. And you know what, that's all we needed. We looked at each other with tears and big grins, and we knew that God was not finished with Jarrett. Doctors just came in shaking their heads in amazement and just basically saying, now don't get your hopes up because he's, he's gonna still take a, a turn for the worse. Uh, we don't expect this to last long. These are the best, most experienced uh, physicians in the area at Children's Hospital in Denver who said he's not going to survive. The extended family gathered to watch him die. They started withdrawing support and then boom, within a day he's a new kid. That's a miracle. Doctors didn't expect him to ever speak or walk, but Jared continued to make steady progress. When he was four, doctors removed his breathing tube. And the first time I heard him say mama and giggle was just the neatest thing I had ever heard. Still, doctors didn't think Jared would ever have a normal life. When preemies get really sick, they often bleed into their heads and Jared did that too. If you look at his scans, they look like Swiss cheese. Uh, you would have expected a very severely neurologically handicapped child, very severely. Uh, but when you watch Jarrett over time, he just improved in every way. He kept improving. Love out! Love <laughs> Jared and Brennan will soon be teenagers. Jarrett's active in sports and just made the honor roll at school. I like to play baseball. I like to play football. And I like to swim. He has certainly fooled many physicians who often um, described what they saw on x-rays and saw what they saw in blood tests and what they read in medical records and made predictions of how he would do. And he's outdone them. He's outdone them all. So yeah, he's a miracle. Mm -hmm. I think it's neat sometimes how God takes us to the end of who we are and what we can do. And he took us to the end of what we could do as parents and what the doctors could do as his caretakers. And then he said, let me just show you what I can do because there's nothing too big for God.